Okay, so we're coming to um, the uh, penultimate session. Uh, this one on um, criminal justice, and um, you've all got programs. You know who's presenting. I won't go over some of the details. Uh, the first one um, by Professor Rosemary Bar uh, Barbaret, who's in our Department of Sociology. I'm Professor Dave Brotherton. Um, chair of, um, of Sociology and uh, at the Graduate Centre. Um, so I should say, you know, that, you know, this is quite an interesting, you know, 2000, where were we, 2012, um, and especially after the last session, but also much of this session, that, you know, it's eight years, where are we now, uh, March or whatever, it's about eight years ago, you know, that we that we held here um, at John Jay um, down in the, uh, the gymnasium um, the first actual uh, deportation conference uh, in the United States, and um, I'm very proud about that, you know, because you know that's that's what we that's what we should be about here: educating for justice and not injustice, right? And uh, and within all uh, knowledge. Uh, especially social scientific knowledge is a kind of moral component and I think we're hearing uh, lots of the moral issues uh, as well as political issues uh, that are both pushing uh, immigration and criminal justice policies uh, in this present um, epoch uh, that I would call a, an e not simply an epoch of moral panic but an epoch of uh, a theatre of cruelty I think we live in a theatre of cruelty and I think we need to go back actually to the, some of the French exponents of surrealism in the 30s to try to get a, the handle on the kind of madness uh, that, that we're living through uh, in the present epoch. And so we, we kind of celebrate, you know, that kind of eighth anniversary of the first deportation conference with our esteemed guests and visitors and um, uh, policy uh, advocates and uh, social scientists here at John Jay, so I want, and I want to welcome everybody, and, but to realise that historical moment as well. So, having said all that, um, we're going to start with Rosemary Barbaret and Diana Rodriguez um, on violence against migrants, migrant workers and their families, followed by um, <laughs> Professor Robert Groh, who happens also <laughs> to be in my department, um, on immigration law, discretion and contemporary Italy, Christopher Lyons from the University of New Mexico, uh, co-authored with um, uh, Maria Velez uh, on neighbourhood immigration, violence and city, political opportunity structures, and um, Ramiro Martinez and um, and Jacob Stowell, uh, I guess both from northeastern. It says here, uh, local context and national consequences, homicide variations across time, and you know, we'll try to keep within the limits as best we can, and uh, and then I'll uh, I'll finish up with a couple of questions and comments, and then hopefully throw out to you guys. Okay, thanks. So first of all, hello everyone. My name is Diana Rodriguez, and as uh, our discussant said, I will be presenting the topic of violence against migrant workers and their families. Um, I've worked with Dr. Rosemary Barbara Ray to compile as many scholarly works as possible from around the world for the past 12 years. We've undertaken this research under the auspices of Criminologists Without Borders, an organization that I'll talk to you about throughout my presentation. The findings will also be presented in the next session of the UN Crime Commission next month. We would also like to acknowledge funding from the PSC CUNY grant. Today's agenda will be as follows. First, I will introduce you to Criminologists Without Borders. Then I'll talk about the UN Crime Commission, uh, the UN Crime Commission um, as it relates to our project. And then I'll discuss what we consider violence to be and the most common forms experienced by migrants and migrant workers. I will then discuss the methods of our projects, the findings, research gaps we discovered, and conclude with important points and policy implications. Criminologists Without Borders is a non-governmental organization who is composed of criminologists that are deeply interested in providing objective information on crime and criminal justice by way of scholarly research. And this is usually for uh, policy-making organizations, namely the United Nations. Criminologists Without Borders ultimately aims to erase existing barriers, such as national boundaries and language differences, which have previously impeded cooperation in global research. Criminologists Without Borders works specifically to inform the UN Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. 
This organ of the UN guides all activities of the UN that relate to crime and criminal justice. Most importantly, this includes how member states approach norms and standards. Thank you. Norm and, norms and standards in this field, is that better? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So how they uh, approach norms and standards in this field. The topic of violence against migrants, migrant workers, and their families was agreed upon as the theme of the 21st session at Turkey's suggestion in the Salvador Declaration from the, from the 12th UN Crime Congress held in Salvador, Brazil in 2010. Though there are standard definitions of, of violence, for the purposes of this project, we chose a broader interpretation of it. This includes physical, social, psychological, or ne negligent harm perpetrated by employers, native citizens, organized crime groups, the state, law enforcement, and other migrants. It is targeted toward migrants or migrant workers and their families mostly because of their migrant status. Though this list is by no means exhaustive, some common forms of violence repeatedly mentioned in the literature include harassment and extortion by natives and law enforcement. This is usually in the forms of um, threatening to report migrants or a family if payments are not made. This, there's also frequent withholding of pay and questionable deductions made, high resentment by natives of the region which include harassment, discrimination, and physical violence. There's also gender-based violence. And violence against migrants is not exclusive to adults. It also happens to children who are abused at school or in social situations. There are also cases of child labor. For the purposes of this project, we chose to, to use the IOM definition of a migrant, which is persons who cross international borders in order to settle into another country, even temporarily. Tourists and short-term business travelers are generally not counted among migrants. With this in mind, we use search terms such as immigrant, emigre, um, illegal worker, hate crime, etc. And we also included research from the past 12 years, from 1999 to 2011, in multiple languages. Academic databases such as LexisNexis, Academic Search Complete, and CQ Global Researcher were used. We also used search uh, engines such as Google, Google Scholar, and Bing. Lastly, correspondents of Criminologists Without Borders were contacted to pool resources and provide relevant data. Only research from scholarly sources were included given that the UN member states already have access to government publications. I included this map to quickly um, illustrate migratory flows. This does not include persons who are trafficked as this is outside of the scope of our study. However, it does allow you to quickly see where people are going and where they're coming from. Some of the general findings of this global literature review are, migrants are denied rights due to their temporary or irregular status, and they are economically and socially marginalized. Due to current economic downturns and political instability in some regions, migrants are blamed for a lack of jobs for citizens and natives. There are also high rates of violence in the workplace. They are usually verbal, but they can sometimes be physical. In many cases, law enforcement and governments are unable or unwilling to help migrants and migrant workers. Legislation may also lack enforcement mechanisms. Domestic violence is a prevalent issue within migrant communities or family units, which is found to be the case in many South and Central American studies, for example. The types of research typically included were qualitative, such as interview-based surveys, and um, program assistance, namely those that provide assistance to migrants and migrant workers, focus groups, and quantitative analyses based on secondary data. This graph illustrates the literature that was collected by region by year. As you can see, during the late 90s and early 2000s, there was little, only little literature on this topic, but the good news is that it's steadily on the rise, especially last year with instances of violence in India and the Middle East, counted here as Asia. This table is a visual representation of the common forms of violence I discussed earlier. As you can see, problems with payment are common across the board, as is gender-based violence. And, um, again, there are factors as discussed in the literature, but it has to be noted that there are dark figures of reporting. In other words, you know, not all forms of violence will be reported. Also, not, not all instances of violence against migrants, migrant workers, and their families will be researched for a wide variety of reasons. Just because a factor, or in this case a form of violence, does not appear in the literature collected does not mean that it does not occur in any given region at any given time. In Asia, migrant workers are typically females who work in small factories or in, as a domestic servant. 
In Indonesia especially, employers have been known to take away passports and documentation so that employees are confined to the home and cannot return to their point of origin. Due to withholding and pay of pay and other abuses, there has been a high volume of suicide of migrant workers, notably in China. Politicians have also been known to incite violence against migrants and migrant workers, such as in the case of India, who the Indians migrate from north to south to work on railroads. In Africa, there's a high rate of xenophobia, especially in South Africa, which is still very much segregated. Migrant workers, especially those who are black, are blamed for lack of employment and economic downturns. Street violence, usually by way of demonstrations, have occurred at various points in time. Illegal migrant workers have been threatened or killed by employers, and many migrant workers are fearful of bandit gangs who usually ambush migrant workers on their travels. There is also an extremely high rate of gender-based violence, namely rape of women working or traveling alone. In Oceania, studies have shown that though there is a high um, rate of legislation which extends to protect migrants and migrant workers against families, it usually only serves to effectively protect citizens and natives of the region. This is especially true in the case of domestic violence, which is shown to be prevalent in this region amongst migrant workers. Migrant work is mostly concentrated in the agrarian sector, such as orchards and farms, and also may include children. European re research features strong xenophobia. In various countries, hate-motivated violence, especially by far-right groups, has been reported. Here, too, citizens blame migrant workers for lack of, of work. There has been documented cases of forced labor, and African women are the largest group discriminated against, notably in Ireland. Within Latin and Central America and the Caribbean, anti-immigrant sentiments have been on the rise. Mexico is currently under a crisis whereby migrant workers are threatened, physically abused, killed, and even kidnapped by opposing groups or organized crime syndicates. Activists for migrant workers have been known to receive the same treatment. Domestic violence is also prevalent among migrants within various countries in this region, and similarly to Africa, workers in the Caribbean who cross from the Dominican Republic to Haiti and vice versa are fearful of gang robbery and extortion by law enforcement. In North America, it has been found that there is a high rate of domestic violence within migrant groups. This is especially true among families situated close to or at borders. Profiling and harassment by law enforcement and natives along the U.S.-Mexico border is common where vigilantes have been known to do the same. In the United States, children of migrants and migrant workers also face violence and discrimination at school due to their identities. There is also the case of forcible re repatriation where migrants are deemed criminally alien and deported back to their country of origin. Such is the case with many Dominicans who have been, reported from, from, have been deported from the United States back to the Dominican Republic. Our discussant, David Brotherton, together with his colleague, Luis Barrios, have done extensive research on this topic. The current literature review has exposed several research gaps which should be addressed. First, across the board, there is more research on victims than on perpetrators and on women, much more so than men. Research also tends to focus on the experiences of the individual rather than that of family units. There is more research on destination countries rather than the country of origin or the migratory process. There is also little research on the effectiveness of criminal justice or on, or on prosecution of perpetrators of violence. Lastly, there is little research which evaluates migrant repatriation programs and or intervention programs. Without this updated and crucial information, our understanding of violence at, against migrants, migrant workers, and their families is incomplete at best. In order to more effectively uh, have legislation and policies which address these issues, there needs to be more updated scholarly research on these topics. Also, more intervention and assistance programs should be sensitive to the unique needs of migrant, migrant workers, and family units. To address the discrimination and violence children are facing at schools, counseling services should be made available and should be effective and culturally competent. Lastly, the current situation of impunity of perpetrators of violence should be ended. It's our hope that with academic research made available to them, countries will work together to draft and enforce legislation that will curtail violence against migrants, migrant workers, and their families. Thank you. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Hope everyone's gotten some coffee, which they brought over by hand. And students bring those. 
Okay, so on July 2nd, 2009, a new package of security laws was officially approved in Italy by a vote in the Senate of 157 in favor, 124 against, and three abstentions. Designed to dramatically increase the surveillance of undocumented immigrants are clandestini. It states that any immigrant entering illegally must pay a fine of between five to 10,000 euros and face expulsion. Voluntary associations, quote unquote, or vigilante groups may be officially enlisted locally to round up clandestini. Security zones are to be established around public areas such as train stations, banks, post offices, parks, public gardens, and bus stops to monitor for clandestini. Those who rent or provide services of any kind to clandestini are subject to imprisonment for six months to three years for a, cl a crime known as favoreggiamento de migrazione clandestino or favoring clandestine immigration. One item the security package does not address is the way Italian immigration law is structured so that immigrants must experience periods of illegality on the way to legality. The primary requirement for regularization under the unified text of immigration law, often referred to as the Bossi Fini Law of 2002, is the oft repeated phrase work and home, casa e lavoro. The catch 22 is that one must have a permit to stay before even being considered to rent or work and the stiff penalties faced by landlords and employers, even if they are already or rarely enforced, provide them a ready reason to exclude the undocumented. Employers are imagined by the law to contact workers abroad so that they may receive a visa in the country of origin and then enter legally. Of course, what happens is that many potential workers come with a tourist visa, overstay the period allowed while working, looking for work, and then must return to their country of origin, apply for a work visa, and wait to enter with the Decreto Flusse. And the Decreto Flusse only opens very rarely and it's very, very difficult to get in. It usually fills within the first five to 10 minutes and there's racist country quotas uh, attached to that. For those seeking asylum or refugee status, claims or demonstrations of poverty are simply not sufficient to gain access. Rather than simply deport such claimants, in Italy they are left to wander and beg for a living. As Valeria Ferraris states, two thirds of the population of foreigners in Italy have had a period of irregular stay because migrants must use, quote, illicit methods to arrive at the condition of a regular stay. Hence, those who are legally present in Italy are mostly the undocumented. Schuster provides similar findings showing how status mobility is quite common in Italy as two thirds of her convenience sample had been without papers at some time during their stay there. In Italy, clandestini mingle freely with Italians and yet are often unable to penetrate the social fabric in a way that offers something more than meager, precarious existence. Broders and Ingberson note, policy ambiguities are found not only in economic constraints, but also, and in Europe more often, in the resistance of professionals, civil groups, and lower levels of government that oppose national policies or put their professional ethics above state policies. In light of such resistance, the impact of surveillance is mitigated. This is especially the case in Italy, where the strength of the left, by comparison with the rest of Europe and the Catholic Church, has led to overt expressions of solidarity unseen in other European states. That's a quote from Schuster, 2005. This paper will show how the surveillance of clandestini in Italy, while tempered by police discretion and local variations, also varies depending on the class and nationality of the immigrant, as well as the narrative they provide to account for themselves. Some illegal immigrants who possess social and cultural capital are able to integrate, while others are caught in seemingly insurmountable social exclusion. I conducted 174 days of participant observation at Services for Immigrants in Tuscany and interviewed 72 immigrants to Italy from 23 countries, 36 men and 36 women, as well as 41 lawyers and other service providers for immigrants regarding their experiences with the law. Roughly two-thirds of interviews with immigrants and all the interviews with service providers were conducted in Italian. I observed 166 cases of immigrant service encounters with attorneys over a period of 155 hours in city-sponsored immigration service centers in Florence, Pistoia, and Prato, and the Cigiele Trade Union in Pistoia. I also interviewed 11 local, regional, and national conferences in Italy lasting a day or more on such themes as migration and racism. As in Schuster's study, quote, given the heterogeneity of the migrant population in Italy, there was no intention to interview a representative sample of migrants. Instead, interviews were conducted with as broad a range of people as possible, especially in terms of legal status and length of residence. De Genova notes, 
quote, illegality is lived through a palpable sense of deportability, whereby some are deported in order that most may remain undeported as workers. The term clandestino, common in the Italian media, is considered politically incorrect by activists who disdain how the term connotes someone furtive and hidden, when many clandestini are in fact unavoidable, there to guide you as you park your car, present, present in any marketplace selling tissues, lighters, and socks. See Kutin in her, her work on this in 2003. While activists prefer the term senza documenti, or undocumented, many immigrants described feeling the need to hide, especially near the police, when they suffered through times of illegality. Yet the burden of clandestine status was relative. Steve, an American in his 50s who had spent much of his adult life in Italy, was concerned about his illegal status, but always in a sort of by-the-way quality, since not having a valid permit to stay in Italy interfered in no way with his lifestyle. It certainly hadn't been an obstacle for him to find a lovely apartment in the center of town or work as a freelancer for some of the town's wealthiest families. Indeed, while many clandestines struggled to keep a cellular phone, Steve let his lapse tired of the burden of an active social calendar. Over time, I tired of hearing Steve worry about what might happen and made an appointment with him to see Julia, a lawyer who had over 10 years of experience working with immigrants at a local city-sponsored immigration center. His tale was lighthearted and breezy, and we often shared a chuckle over his predicament as when he complained that he simply couldn't bother with waiting in the long line at the Questura to file his paperwork. As we proceeded through Steve's various questions and qualms, Julia basically told him not to bother trying to become regular, since it would be such a hassle for the police to understand his story that they would resent hearing it. The worst consequence would be that he would be sent back to the United States, where he had family and fr friends at any rate. The primary obstacle was that Steve did not want to tell his landlord and employer who had trusted Steve and never asked if he had his legal papers and now make the effort to regularize him. But it's not as if you have to ask your true employer to make that demand for you, Julia said, and Steve nodded. In other words, the city lawyer for immigrants advised that Steve enlist one of his many friends to tell a white lie in order to circumvent the minor inconvenience of not having a permit of stay. Hence what Graham refers to as easy pass nation, in which the crossing of militarized borders becomes a mere technical formality, but for a privileged minority only, may apply based on racial characteristics or nationality, even if one lacks the actual pass. The contrast of this encounter with advice this same worker gave to an African client was striking. Timothy was a Nigerian man who had approached me in a kindly manner a number of times in my travels about town. I asked if he might wish to be interviewed and he consented. He told me he had finished high school and then studied to be an electrician. His father was a member of a vigilante group and was attacked by a pseudo-official organization. When he was 20, his father was murdered and Timothy was brutally attacked. The attackers thought Timothy was also a member, but he said he wasn't, although his father had told him all of his secrets. Timothy told me these secrets could greatly damage the organization which had killed his father, which is why they tried to kill him and still wanted him dead. He showed me scars of where he'd been shot in the back, knifed in the stomach, his throat was cut, and his left shin was badly beaten. He had no passport, having left only with an international ID. He managed to make it to a hospital where he was treated without giving his name. Shortly thereafter, he left with about 40 other people on foot across the desert to Libya. He said he had no food or water and they drank their own urine to survive. I asked, can't you get sick from that? And he said that if you believe it will help you, then it will help you. If you believe it will hurt you, then it will hurt you. Over half of their party died in the desert and about 16 arrived in Libya. He found work there, staying for about two years, but as a Christian, he was persecuted by Muslims and had to leave again. In the night, he went to a boat and begged and pleaded to be allowed to board. He said they drifted for over a week and many more died, some falling out of the boat, others due to hunger and thirst. Throughout, he had no idea where he wanted to go, but only needed to escape. He says that miraculously, three fish pulled the boat for a couple of hours toward Lampedusa. Otherwise, he said, they were off course and surely would have been lost. I called the local immigration service center and told them Timothy's story, saying it sounded like he was a perfect candidate for political asylum. The woman who answered said he had to request that when he entered Italy. I said he was too traumatized at the time and simply walked out of the camp. She told me I could bring him in to see Julia. In the meantime, I translated Timothy's story into a brief two-page narrative, which I gave him to keep the following Tuesday when he went to see Julia. I also checked the internet and found that there was a great deal of information on vigilante justice in Nigeria, and much of it had taken place around the times and places that Timothy had described to me. When we met with Julia, I began telling her Timothy's story in Italian and then pulled out the brief account which I'd written up. Julia's first question was, when did you come? He said, a year ago, and she blanched. 
who went over the story and worked as a translator for Timothy, who didn't seem to understand most of what she said. Timoth uh, Julia read my account, saying it needed many more details as she wrote notes in the margin concerning items like the date and place of birth of his parents and siblings, their names, any associations to which he belonged, people who knew and could vouch for the fact that his parents were dead, the role of his father in the group, the name of the doctor and hospital who had helped him, the date he was attacked, the school he went to, anyone who knew him in Nigeria. She said it all had to be verified. I asked if he needed a lawyer, and she said not necessarily. What he would do would be to present his story at the Questura, and then he would have an appointment to sit before a tribunal who would ask him questions for specific details about his experience. If he did not convince them, he would receive an order of expulsion. I asked if he did insert all the facts in his story, could he get public representation? She said he could try the Anti-Discrimination Center, which specialized in a select few highly notable cases. She spent about a half hour with us, and I thanked her. On the way out, Timothy thanked me, saying that he would not pursue the case further, and went back out to sell tissues, lighters, and socks on the street. To contrast the respective circumstances of Stephen Timothy highlights how surveillance is not objective, but is biased by issues of race and class. Surely, if one were to determine criteria for social inclusion based on suffering, looking at obvious daily suffering regardless of the veracity of their stories and their pasts, Timothy would have a nice job and apartment, and Steve would be selling lighters on the street. Yet Timothy's stories, outlandish as it may be, magical fish, is all he has to provide him with some hope he might socially integrate. Very likely the story was not offered in hopes of gaining political asylum, but in the hope of building a relationship which Ferraris has noted, and I certainly affirm, is the key ingredient for moving from a clandestine to a regular status in Italy. As she states, friends do not only represent a secure refuge, but also an occasion, a card to play to change one's life uh, conditions. It is such a relationship, much more than any documents, which provide a route to integration. In conclusion, the security package dramatically augments both opportunities for surveillance and punishment of irregular immigrants, yet simply because such a law has been passed does not necessarily bode that circumstances for clandestini will dramatically change for a number of reasons. First, Italy is notorious as a nation of laws which are either other enforceable or not enforced. Such a phenomenon is due to the often heated demagogic atmosphere of Italian politics as much as to the regional independence and local autonomy and individ individualized discretion. Now that the security package has gone into effect, there are pronounced local variations in implementation and few if any measures of national oversight to ensure consistency. Second, those areas of the north of Italy in which there is ostensibly the most support for such a measure also stand to lose the most from implementation of the security package. As Calavita showed, while areas of the north often feature the harshest anti-immigrant rhetoric, they simultaneously provide the most substantial infrastructure in Italy to support immigration social immigra integration, including real provisions for housing, social services, etc., simply because northern industries have the most to gain from the immigrant presence. Italians surely are not unaware of such cases as, quote, the nearly complete disappearance of the garment industry in the Dutch capital, unquote, due to the crackdown on the employment of illegal immigrants. Italy, with an already precarious economy in which the garment industry and many others such as agriculture and domestic service are primarily dependent on predominantly illegal immigrant labor, could ill afford to follow suit. Third, despite Italians' desire to pulire le cose, or clean the situation, as many people told me, the detention and expulsion of clandestini is no simple matter. Already Italian prisons and detention centers are overfilled with immigrants, and in a time of stagnant economic growth leading to threats of reduced pensions, there is little political will to continue warehousing clandestini. Furthermore, brothers in Emerson, um, brothers in Emerson wrote, uh, the expulsion of illegal aliens can only function when identity, nationality, and preferably migration history can be established. If not, extradition is likely to be resisted from re within by lawyers and judges and from abroad, countries of transit and origin, in addition to personal resistance from illegal aliens themselves. And many would often claim they didn't speak Italian or they would uh, claim different countries or aliases. In short, it is doubtful whether Italians can make the dream embodied in the security package of a nostalgic return to a society that never existed come true. And it is doubtful if, at the end of the day, they would truly want to. Nonetheless, the threat imposed by the security package is real enough. Even if no efforts are made to implement these new laws, one might assume that if the threat is felt by immigrants, producing a more hidden, silent, and docile, docile workforce, many will be content that the laws had their intended effects. 
Yet surely many unintended effects will also follow from such a threat. For example, when Californians passed the infamous Save Our State initiative, Proposition 187 in 1994, they hoped to prevent illegal immigrants from using social services, health care, and public education. Yet even after the bill was found unconstitutional in federal court, immigrants feared bringing their legal citizen children in for services, leading to a rise in expensive publicly funded emergency room procedures. At best, efforts to thwart illegal immigration and illegal immigrants' efforts to resist such control result in a perverse cat and mouse game in which ever more intrusive efforts of surveillance seek to monitor and limit the opportunities of the undocumented who must struggle to stay hidden in order to support their families. As Broders and Engberson note, such a dynamic creates thriving industries of bastard institutions compelling the undocumented further into criminal underworlds. Thank you. Okay, well as the title suggests here, um, my co-authors and I in this paper examine the relationship between neighborhood immigration and violence, but we ask how the city level political opportunity structure or the context of reception for immigrants um, at the city level influences this relationship at the neighborhood level. And as we've been discussing quite a bit today, Public opinion and the rhetoric of politicians have often equated both legal and illegal immigration with an array of social problems, including serious violence. And this consistent reference to the menace of the immigrant population implies that stricter policies that curb immigration or re reduce services for immigrants who are here um, are part and parcel of crime control. And that is getting tough on immigration to somehow be good for our neighborhoods um, and reduce violence. But we also know that for decades, criminological research has tempered these claims. Um, as we've been discussing, most contemporary research shows either no relationship between immigration and neighborhood violence or more consistently and more commonly an inverse relationship. And again, the most common theoretical explanation for that relationship is referred to as the immigrant revitalization perspective. And this states that immigrants can actually maintain and revitalize areas rather than disorganize them or destabilize them. And this could happen for a number of reasons. First, immigrants might bring to neighborhoods um, relatively established or strong familial ties and develop additional non-kin or fictive kin ties that could aid in social control. And second, immigrants can perhaps um, strengthen the institutional base of communities, as some research suggests. And third, large numbers of immigrants can help reinvigorate ethnic enclave economies, which can provide economic growth, jobs, and higher wages, perhaps. Um, for these and many other reasons, most recent theorizing suggests that immigrants can be good for, for communities and neighborhoods, and especially for the relatively poor communities that receive the vast majority of immigrants. And although this inverse relationship is becoming relatively well established in social science research, um, I think that our understanding of the scope of that relationship is limited, especially given the changing geography of immigration into new reports of entry. Um, this changing geography highlights that there's a substantial variation in the capacity of cities to support and receive newcomers. Immigration scholars have stressed that the political context of reception is important and helps, re helps shape the incorporation of immigrants, that is the ability of immigrants to engage in local civic and social life. And so these insights really motivate the central question of this study is that do these varying political contexts at the city level of reception influence the capacity of, of immigrants to revitalize neighborhoods and maybe decrease violence? And so to motivate this question, we draw on political opportunity theory, which highlights the importance of the broad political environment and the relative openness of political regimes to the concerns and grievances and demands of minorities. And here we propose the concept of immigrant political opportunities, uh, referring to the political receptivities of cities to immigrant demands in particular. And there's a number of ways we can think about opportunities for, politi for immigrants, uh, political opportunities at the city level, including in the electorate, in terms of its supportive elect electorate, and specific co policy climates. Um, some studies, for example, show that immigrants are more likely to organize uh, collectively in cities that cast greater votes uh, or support for Democratic presidential candidates, for example. Uh, the recent controversy over Alabama and Arizona's laws um, 
draw attention to the considerable variation as well to immigrant-related policy climates um, at the same time that we have jurisdictions ratifying stringent anti-legal immigrant policies like 287G and secure communities. We have other cities taking relatively pro-immigrant stances and declaring themselves sanctuary cities uh, that limit cooperation with federal enforcement efforts. Further, cities and uh, with greater political incorporation of minorities into elected offices reflect opportunity structures for immigrants. Um, in a recent study of an immigrant neighborhood in Los Angeles, Sandoval, for example, argues that strong representation in the Los Angeles City Council of Latinos encouraged the immigrant res residents of this one neighborhood to, tr to trust the greater political process and that this distrust in turn facilitated collective action between residents and outside actors that led to crime control and specific revitalization strat strategies. If Latinos were not part of this dominant um, coalition in, in Los Angeles, Sandoval argues that these types of concrete steps would not have occurred at, in this particular neighborhood. We can also talk about incorporation more generally into government bureaucracies and service organizations. I think here particularly relevant would be the incorporation of immigrants and other minorities in the police force, which um, as some research suggests can encourage immigrant uh, friendly policies and also trust between law enforcement and local constituents. And finally, some research points to the general form of government and mayor council forms of government in particular. These are where uh, you know, leaders are elected. Uh, these may be more permeable and open to the, the, um, to, to the needs and concerns of uh, local groups. And so we argue here that these immigrant political opportunities should condition the immigration and violence link. Namely, immigration will be especially, or should be especially helpful in reducing violence in cities that are sympathetic to the needs of immigrants. Um, and we speculate that this might be the case because these opportunities can set um, in motion a spiral of trust between, uh, among immigrants and the broader community that enhances social organization within immigrant neighborhoods and perhaps decreases the isolation that newcomers can face. So immigrant trust in the political structure can facilitate involvement in social and political life, attachment to and ownership of, of neighborhoods and communities, and then mobilization on behalf of concerns of the community, like safety. In contrast, in relatively closed regimes, immigrants have fewer resources to draw upon and face greater pediments to incorporation. This means that they face greater odds of social isolation, and we might expect closed regimes then to attenuate the protective association between immigrant concentration and violence, and perhaps even lead to processes of segmented assimilation and marginalization. And so we examine these questions with data from the National Neighborhood and Crimes Study. Um, this is a very unique collection of data that brings together for the first time multi-level information uh, for almost 9,000 census tracts across 87 large cities in the United States. And we append those data with data um, indicators of immigrant political opportunities that we gather from secondary sources. And here we're focusing on two, two types of violent crime, robbery and homicide. And so in talking about our variables, we can divide them into tract and city level covariates. Uh, at the track level, we're most interested here in the association between immigrant concentration and counts of homicide and robbery. We measure immigrant concentration here with a two-item index that combines the percent foreign, recent foreign-born, that's the percent of the foreign-born who arrived between 90 and 2000, and linguistic isolation with the percent of households in which no one over the or eight, 14 or older speaks English very well. And then we also control for a variety of other c controls for um, a, a track level factors associated with violence, including the spatial lag of homicide and robbery for those who are interested. At the city level, we concentrate here on the moderating potential of these five indicators of political opportunity. There are others, we focus on five. Sanctuary cities, again, captures those cities that have at least one law or resolution on the books that limits the local enforcement of immigration. Percent votes for gore, in this case, captures uh, potential audience receptivity to immigrant claims. And we measure incorporation here in two ways. One, political incorporation to the city elected offices and incorporation to the police force or representation on the police force. And finally, we measure mayor council forms of government, which according to some research re represent more permeable, uh, permeable regimes. 
and of course control for a host of other city um, level covariates that are related to violence. On to our methods. Um, technically, we have a nested data and a structure here, and we have count outcomes. So if you're interested in the terminology, we estimate a series of HLM Poisson models. Um, but there's a major problem with cross-sectional research like this. Um, a classic question is, do immigrants cause more, less crime in a neighborhood, or do they somehow select into neighborhoods that have less crime, in which case we have the causality perhaps inc incorrect. So to try to address some of these issues, we employ what we call an instrumental variable approach that attempts to purge our measure of immigration from endogeneity with violence. I can get into the details if you're interested, um, but for now, uh, we find that the change, the change of percent Latino between 90 and 2000 to be a valid instrument empirically and theoretically. In these multi-level instrumental variable models, we concentrate uh, what, and what we call these um, interaction, the cross-level interactions that gauge the moderating effect of city-level context uh, and its ability to moderate the relationship between immigration and homicide or robbery. Um, but before we do that, I'll talk about the general or the overall uh, average effects of immigration on violence. And not surprisingly, we also find that consistent with the idea that immigration somehow protects neighborhoods, an overall inverse relationship between immigration and both homicide and robbery, again, net of all other city and track controls. But this relationship varies substantially across cities. In an HLM parliament, we call, parlance, we call this random slope variation. Um, it varies, um, ranges from negative in most cases to even, to some cases, positive. Um, and so we establish this variation, and now we try to explain some of this variation, perhaps with these political opportunity structures. And so I'll begin first showing these interactions for homicide, net of city and track controls. Of the five indicators of political opportunities, Four of them moderate the relationship between immigration and homicide as we expected. So immigrants, um, the neighborhoods benefit more from immigration when they're in cities that have sanctuary policies, um, right here. Also in cities that have greater uh, support for gore. And in cities that have more incorporation of minorities into uh, municipal offices, whoops, and um, into the police force as well. The only exception here is that in Model 5, mayor council governments do not moderate the relations between immigra immigration and homicide. So to get a sense of what this, these interactions look like, um, this shows the, illustra this illustrates the interaction with city level incorporation to the police force. We can see obviously that as immigration increases, homicide decreases, but that, that decrease is most precipitous in cities that have greater representation of, of minorities on the police force as seen in, with the blue line. Right? And so now we look at how this compares with homicide, which is ideo ideologically you know, quite distinct from, for, uh, so excuse me, with robbery, which is different from homicide ideolo ideologically. But interestingly, we find very um, dis obvious similarities. Three of the four significant interactions hold for robbery as well, right? St. Therese cities percent vote for Gore and minority police incorporation. The only differences here is that incorporation to the, into elected offices is not um, a significant moderator as it was for ho homicide. All right, so that's a quick look at the results. Um, to summarize, uh, consistent again with the idea that immigration somehow protects against crime, Concentration in a tract is inversely associated on average with homicide and robbery, but that association varies significantly across cities, and immigrant political opportunities seem to account for some of that variation. So with a couple exceptions here, our measures of immigrant political opportunities enhance the inverse association between immigration and violence, presumably because they facilitate revitalization processes and social organization by reinforcing trust attachment and involvement. Now we can't measure that in this particular study, but that's what we presume theoretically. Um, to conclude, contrary to public opinion and much political rhetoric, this research joins a chorus of others in suggesting that immigrants might make communities safer, yet the ability of immigrants to translate into less violence may partly depend on the political context of immigrant reception. So open regimes with, with extensive political opportunities for immigrants seem best able to, to encourage this, this revitalization capacity of immigrants. 
In contrast, our results imply at least that the punitive policies being in place in many states and in other jurisdictions may ironically decrease the potential benefits of immigration for our communities, and by marginalizing newcomers, our less open regimes may set in motion constraints to immigrant incorporation and prosperity that may have less than ideal consequences for the viability of our communities. Let me begin by uh, thanking the conference organizers for the um, invitation uh, to come to, uh, where are we at, New York City? Or <laughs> I, I look around the classroom, for, for some reason I think I'm in Miami or something, so maybe it's just the 70s or 80s, of, 80s effects starting to catch up with me or something, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, it, uh, today, it's been a very interesting day uh, for me personally, because I think back, I'm, I'm at that point for some reason, I'm starting to think back or, or looking uh, back on the uh, field, uh, maybe because I'm turning 40 tomorrow, but as, uh, as I'm thinking back on the uh, research literature, even you know, 10, 15, much less 20 years ago, it was this much smaller field. It was a much different discipline, and uh, it's been really exciting today for me personally to see this, you know, battery or battalion of students uh, engaged in this type of research. So I'm really uh, pleased and excited to uh, to have seen that all day today, and I'm I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you all, you know, take the next step. And certainly today's um, um, activities are are, um, are a huge step in that direction. So. Uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that, and um, I'll move on from um, from that with the um, um, other with uh, uh, Professor Smith's comments in mind about uh, cut the introduction and just go directly to the findings. Uh, this afternoon, I had uh, ten minutes of uh, of an introduction that I was thinking of uh, going over, but since the introduction's published um, in the um, uh, the program, I'll just make a, a quick a quick note about how this is really a story of uh, local settings that ends with a, a, national, uh, a national look. We start uh, by looking at the city of Miami in the 1980s, looking at the impact of immigration and crime. Uh, as many of us remember, um, well, up until 1980, the Mariel boat lift uh, immigration and crime, uh, or, or at least uh, the moral panic or, or the issue in and of itself was really basically off the radar. Uh, after Mariel, th that type of uh, national concern over immigration crime patterns, the anxiety right, about these different Latino groups uh, really re re reappeared and, and uh, reemerged in a large part because some of these groups felt that uh, these new Hispanic immigrants, right, were threatening American society. They were threatening our, uh, what uh, people were talking about, um, you know, the national fabric. They were avoiding assimilation. Uh, they were creating national security issues. And, and a lot of the same sort of rhetoric, right, that we've been hearing over the past few years about the Southwest border was really something um, that reminded me of Miami in 1980. Right, a lot of the rhetoric about Mariel has been replicated uh, directly into some of the dialogue and some of the conversations that we're talking about uh, with the immigration and crime literature right now. And um, I just, um, um, at times when I've been uh, gathering data and looking over some of the uh, recent research literature, you know, it. Uh, Many of us in criminology think that we're, we are, you know, reinventing the wheel, right? And in many ways, um, uh, today's rhetoric about the Southwest, you know, you can replace it or just flip it, right, with rhetoric about, uh, about Mariel and, uh, and Cubans in Miami uh, in 1980. Now, what this is, is basically a story about, um, about homicide over time. Let me see if I know how to um, uh, move this. Um, at one end, of course, this is a story, this is a story of two uh, Latino majority cities, the city of San Antonio and the city of Miami, as I mentioned. Um, 
on the one hand, uh, Miami's very unique. Most of you, you know, know that you're familiar. There's been a, you're familiar with the flights between here and Miami, and of course, uh, studying in South Beach and you know going to the club and conducting uh, different types of research um, over spring breaks and, and late at night. Uh, um, in contrast, uh, San Antonio is a very uh, different uh, border city. It's honored by the southwest border. It's two hours away from uh, Laredo. Um, it's actually a place where I think uh, Maria Velez uh, spent some time also, but uh, I think we did go, we did live in, in very different neighborhoods. Uh, but either way, I just wanted you to to see how we talk about uh, these two different cities because we're concerned about local context, right? We're concerned about talking about the immigration and crime story and these two very different um, uh, and unique uh, Latino majority cities with different types of immigration strands. Miami, of course, as I've mentioned already, had that uh, huge transformation in 1980. Uh, San Antonio, on the other hand, is a typical border city, right? It's had a very long and moderate um, um, prox um, um, influx of immigrants crossing the border, and of course its proximity to the U.S.-Mexico border has made it um, a place that's reflective of the um, immigration transformation on, on the southwest border in different ways. So our interest here is, of course, uh, reminding us again that local context matters and the similarities and differences were harbingers of a, of a still ongoing national transformation. Now certainly we can learn something uh, different from each research setting to round out our understanding of national patterns, which is what we do um, at the end. And let me just um, sort of move quickly to um, some of our, our findings. Um, we're interested in asking very simple, uh, or what's, what seems to be simple now, uh, research questions. Uh, how does immigration impact Miami and San Antonio over the 1980s and 1990s, respectively? We look at those two time points because those were peri periods in which uh, homicide, especially very specific types of homicide, drug homicides in Miami and gang-related homicides in, my, in uh, San Antonio peaked. So we were interested in seeing, well, what happens when we measure escalation, meaning uh, the very uh, sort of garden variety arguments that turn lethal uh, killings uh, relative to those that were gang-related killings and or drug-related homicides in those cities, and what role did immigration play on the uh, drug and gang-related killings. Um, we mentioned, let me just mention quickly, we, we um, well in this case, I uh, gathered those data by hand in the City of Miami Police Department and the um, uh, Miami-Dade Medical Examiner's Office over the, uh, most, of the uh, most of the 1990s and uh, 2000 period, so it took, uh, it took uh, several years to gather those data, actually, and it's, um, it was always very interesting to me because I just happened to be in Miami uh, during the winter uh, when I was at the University of Delaware. I refer to it as the uh, period in my life when I was doing time in Delaware uh, before I moved to FIU, and it was um, uh, always fun to um, uh, dig through some of these homicide um, archives. Uh, the city of San Antonio, I was born and raised there, so luckily I had uh, family members and friends who were able to uh, help me access data in the San Antonio Police Department and also the uh, Bear County Medicals, Medical Examiner's Office. Um, on the other hand, um, it's unfortunate because once you start digging through data, you also realize how many family members and friends you have that are also in the data. So it's, uh, it's a reminder of, uh, of, of uh, many different things or why you might not want to go home and, and conduct um, original empirical research. Um, quickly, uh, Miami homicide motivations. We'll just uh, begin quickly with the discussion of uh, the homicide motivations in Miami. Uh, remember, again, by definition, at least according to commentators in the popular, popular media, 
we should expect more homicides in immigrant-heavy communities, right? That's part of the, the uh, rhetoric that we've been hearing um, all morning and, of course, uh, throughout the past few years. And if um, uh, the issue in Miami and San Antonio in these different time periods and these different types of homicides, we should expect to see that here. We should also expect to see um, or have more drug homicides in areas with high levels of uh, immigration since that influence included uh, the much maligned 1980s uh, Mario Boatlift refugees. I know that some of the, uh, the uh, students in, in, in the room might not be as familiar uh, with the boat lift. Um, I asked some of my students at Northeastern you know, how familiar they were with the boat lift and of course uh, half of them were familiar with the boat lift because they knew the dialogue to the movie Scarface, right? And the other half uh, thought they were familiar with the boat lift, but they confused it with uh, the Elian Gonzalez um, episode. So, um, you know, I don't want to say watch Scarface, but um, it, it gives you a, a flavor of the times um, in Miami. These are, I just want you to see this. Right, it's not going to be on a quiz or anything unless Shirley and Dan want it, um, want it posted on a journal exam or something. But here in this, in this slide, right, this table, I just want you to see the impact right, of, of uh, immigration concentration on total homicides and drug-related homicides in Miami. These are homicide data, again, that I gathered, right, that I read. Uh, that I copied, that I coded, I had access to the homicide detectives uh, data over the 1980s and um, these were data that I coded or, or read or interpreted as being uh, drug related. It had something to do with the drug related killing. Um, sometimes there was a killing, some you know people would get killed over the quality of dope, right? Somebody bought something, they didn't get high or, or you know, there was a, an event that occurred, uh, drug market ha homicides, fights over turf, anything that had to do with a drug-related or drug-specific homicide, uh, we code it as a drug, drug homicide. Notice here, Miami is uh, an immigrant, a new immigrant community, right? It doesn't have the uh, same type of uh, Latino population as you see in the Northeast or, or Southwest. So there were very few uh, gang-related homicides or what we would interpret or define as a gang-related homicide, right? which is something that's very different than what we see in other parts of the city. And part of, in, in, that, in part, that's because of the relatively new nature right, of this uh, majority immigrant city. But here you see that the drug-related homicides are lower in places that had a higher uh, immigrant population, right? Or, which is how, how we define the immigrant uh, index. Um, quickly, you'll see the same sort of effect. This is, uh, remember again, this is Miami in the 1980s, so this captures uh, the Mariel po population in there. Um, and you see, again, the same sort of effect for uh, Latino homicide victims and non-Latino uh, white victims, right? That is, again, that the Latino homicides and non-Latino white homicide victimizations were lower in places that had more what? More what? Okay. <laughs> And this is Miami, so um, uh, I know things are, uh, it's, it's a place that has uh, the Latin, you know, Latin Americanization of race, and, you know, we, we know what, um, how that might or might not be different, but, you know, I had access to the files, and um, I was able to uh, make those assessments. Um, let me go back to the city of San Antonio. Again, again uh, homicides peaked in San Antonio in the 1990s. Um, a different story than what you see in Miami. Uh, San Antonio does have um, 
an old gang culture, right, that dates back to at least the 1930s. Uh, this notion of the uh, zoot suit riots and the zoot suiters and all of that that you remember reading about um, for the historical data in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. A lot of that started in San Antonio, right, on the west side of um, the public housing areas that we call the courts. Uh, we were born, I was born and raised in San Antonio, so as uh, many of you know, um, there isn't a lot to do uh, in San Antonio other than go to the Spurs games and, you know, watch them win. Um, and I just mentioned that because I was remembering the year 1999. Um, if I remember correctly, that was the year that the uh, Spurs won their first national championship. And I can't remember where it was or, or where that occurred. Was it here over the Knicks or no, maybe it was in Madison Square Garden? So <laughs> that was just a, a, a fond memory of, of mine. Um, anyway, total homicides gang-related homicides, drug-related homicides, another majority Latino city, a different decade, a very different place, right, with respect to local history, local settings, right, the history of immigration, uh, proximity to the border. But again, here, we see the same sort of negative or null effect, right, that we've seen in other places. Here, the, the gang-related homicides, right? The courts, the places that are in and around downtown, uh, the places you rarely go to, um, uh, since most tourists stay on the Riverwalk unless they, they happen to go to a party at Lalo Valdez's house or something, um, you'll notice, again, that the gang-related homicides, which is an issue that's related or that's associated with uh, the immigrant uh, Latino population, the heavily Mexican origin population in San Antonio is one that's really um, lower in places that have more immigrants, right? Or have a higher level or higher proportion of immigrants in this very different uh, Latino majority city. Again, about what about the uh, race and ethnic specific homicides? Um, again, like Miami, you'll see that um, you see the same sort of uh, negative or null effect right? when, we, when you look at the impact of immigration on, on white, Latino, and uh, black homicides. Um, here you'll see that the, um, the, the non-Latino white homicides are st statistically lower in places with heavy immigrants. This is, in the, again, in the city of San Antonio. Um, this is in the 1990s. Uh, one last, one last uh, uh, finding. Uh, we, we talk in the, in the, the paper, we talk about local context. We start with Miami in the 80s, San Antonio in the 90s. And we try to end nationally, and this is something that we do, um, I think this is in the year 2000. These are homicides uh, for U.S. counties uh, across uh, the entire United States. Right? These are places that um, uh, have at least one Latino homicide, 10%, uh, um, I forget, of... Uh, uh, we, we imposed, uh, uh, you know, some, some very basic uh, minimum population estimates, and we see here that nationally, right, uh, white, black, and Latino homicides are lower across the country, right, in places that have, that have fewer immigrants. Now, let me just close this quickly, right, but just reminding you with a couple of points here in the red that we reported results from comparative cases, different time points, uh, different types of homicide motivation, uh, individual, community, national levels, and even controlled for Latino regional concentration. Now, the findings were clear and unequivocal. Un unequivocal, right? More immigrants did not necessarily mean more homicide and that held across time and place. Okay, so if you want to see the rest, um, we'll be able to uh, get that to you later. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Amira and Jacob. 
So I'm just I'm just going to, you know, ten minutes or something, um, make a few kind of points about you know some of the common themes and perhaps uh, a few of the questions, and then hopefully ten minutes for you guys to uh, do your thing. Um, I'm just uh, I asked to bring Jock Young, who you know he's been talked about a lot today, especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the moral panic. As you know, Jock and Stanley Cohen were the originators of that concept, and Jock's work was heralded earlier on vis-a-vis uh, -vis social bulimia. So I'm glad Jock's here. Anyway, so these are, the, as I see, some of the, the some of the common themes. Um, you know, firstly, you know, it, it's it's uh, remarkable, I suppose, um, how um, Criminal justice uh, intersects so much of the immigrant experience, uh, but it's it's not all immigrants that experience this, is it? Um, your millionaires from Hong Kong, um, or your millionaires from uh, Rio de Janeiro, or your millionaires from London do not have this experience, I assure you. And so this is basically the experience of uh, immigrants usually immigrants uh, of colour, usually immigrants who are poor immigrants. Uh, you see this very specifically if you look at deportation. The colour of deportation is around 95% black and brown. Okay? Um, when we talk about um, you know, people who are opposed to uh, affirmative action, we never talk about the Irish in New York City. Uh, as Jock always says, who's had the most uh, positive experience vis-à-vis -vis affirmative action of probably any immigrant group. So we're talking, we must always think about, when we talk about immigration, take it out of this bubble, right? this generalizable bubble, and be very race-specific and class-specific, and also in the time period in which we're talking. Right? And it's good that, you know, Ramirez is talking about his time, these different time slots and, and various other people, that it varies across time. Moral panics vary across time. It varies, it varies according to what the economic requirements are. Right? of corporate capitalism uh, in, in, uh, in this fair United States. Right? The whole period of time when we wanted undocumented immigrants and we weren't really uh, supposedly enforcing uh, some of the, the laws of expulsion. And now suddenly we come through this, uh, into this neoliberal period and we can't enforce enough of them. But they're split, but the corporations and the, and the ruling elites actually split about this. It's not uh, some kind of uh, hegemonic block that agrees that we need to deport them all or that we need to have an amnesty and so on and so forth. And yet it becomes resolved right, in some funny way in America through the criminal justice system rather than through where it should be the political system. Because immigration is a political question. right? It's a political and economic question. It's not a criminal question. We criminalize it. And that's why so many of the, the scholars now talk about it as crimigration. And in, in, uh, in, in England, they're now talking about a, a criminology of mobility to try to get at this new kind of or enhanced uh, form of othering, right? Which is the second theme. It's the, how the forms of othering, othering vary across time and across contexts, right? And it was very important in many of the, whether it was uh, uh, Garot's, you know, Robert's thing in Italy, in northern Italy, or it's um, uh, Chris's, you're talking about, you know, different political opportunity structures, and it, you go from city to city, or whether it's Miami or San Antonio, it's very, very important to understand the context in which these social problems become crime problems, right? Social problems become crime problems in certain political periods. And it's terribly important to understand the politics of criminal justice and the politics of criminology. Right? That what we are supposed to do as social scientists is really is to deconstruct that politics and bring it back to a kind of understandable empirical reality check which, uh, which uh, our distinguished guests uh, have attempted to do. And they've done it through different methods. Right? A shout out to uh, the graduate students. Right? Some are using very you know, positivistic approaches, you know, very orthodox approaches, you know, have that, with their own language and their own uh, rhetorics. Right? Others use a qualitative ethnography and so on and so forth. You have a range of methods to go about your studies. Right? Don't think that criminology to hold that journal up and that's it. No, it isn't actually. 
right? And it, in fact, the, the complexity of the situation we face, the complexity of the populations we're studying, demand that you use different methods, right? And it's a travesty of social science if you think that it's simply about going out and collecting data and banging it in a chart and working out an equation that does it, right? It actually betrays your relationship to the subject, that the subject becomes reified and quickly becomes an object. And we're trying to recuperate right, our studies. And that's why we have a range of perspectives here uh, this afternoon. It's important to um, emphasize that, uh, particularly in this college. Uh, and the, the other point, of course, then, this leads to the, the, these problems, these issues, the way we approach it, are by their nature interdisciplinary. Immigration can only be understood through multiple gazes, sociology, criminology, criminal justice, and cultural studies. You see, a lot missing out a lot of the, some of the, 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 the presentations is culture. You can't talk about context without talking about culture. And how do you understand culture? Well, of course, you can do surveys, and you could do this, and you could do that, but essentially, you need to go in there. Right? You need, to, you need to observe it, you need to experience it, you need to archive it, and you need to do it across time. Right? And a lot of in, in these presentations, they talked about time. They talked about time in the field, they talked about cross time from the 1980s to 2000. So many of social science studies are done with these silly little studies of databases that take a few weeks and they go and they publish and so on and so forth. They say nothing about what goes on over time. Trajectories, tendencies, right? There's hardly, for example, nowadays, you tell me anybody who's doing any community studies. I think the last community studies that I read was probably done in the 1960s. We do very specialized, we focus on terribly specialized problems within specialized populations, as if they're not part of a whole community, you see. And that this is very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous in a particular period now, right now where we have whole communities that are becoming criminalised and are becoming under the fear of surveillance, as Guro talked about. Right? If in New York City, in this fair city, 635,000 people were stopped and frisked last year. 85% of them were black and Latino. Most of them were under 21 years of age. Right? Now, if I were in an authoritarian society, I would say that's fair game. That's probably where, you know, that's probably what it is. You live in an authoritarian society. Oh, no, we don't. We live in America. We live in democracy land. We live in New York City, land of freedom and God knows what else. No. <laughs> no, right? We live in a particular period where people practice criminal justice. Actually, what they're doing is they're practicing politics. They just call it criminal justice, right? And that's what a lot of uh, these um, our esteemed guests were really uh, talking to. Um, what's the time? Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Okay, I do have some you know questions of everybody, but if we've only got ten minutes uh, for uh, for questions and answers, and I think it's right. Does that be better, right? If we go, okay. So you yeah, have some questions and whatever commentary. David. Um, David. Hi. So I this can. is for Dr. Martinez. Um, and anyone else who could answer it. I'm trying to, I'm happy about this research that's sort of debunking that aspect of social disorganization theory which says immigration is criminogenic. But I'm having trouble understanding the construct of heterogeneity um, versus homogeneity. So if we're thinking about, for instance, your, your comparison of Little Haiti and Liberty City, um, when I'm looking at that, I, I see both of those communities as homogenous, right? If you have one that's concentrated with primarily um, Haitian immigrants and then one that's African-American concentrated to see advantage. So um, I'm just trying to understand the, how heterogeneity and homogeneity are being defined. Is a is an immigrant community, even if everyone's came, coming from the same small island, considered heterogeneous because it's compared to the mainstream US, or 
is it heterogeneous within that community? I don't know if this makes sense. Thanks. Um, what, what, which, uh, which article are you, are you talking about? Today's no. presentation, <laughs> or <laughs> okay? Then, then which? Um, um, uh, Okay. Um, if I rem if I remember correctly, we were uh, this was um, part part of, of of this is part of the my my Miami story is you know I'm digging through these boxes, and I'm noticing there's these variations, right within Latino groups, right. So there were the Mariels and you know older Cubans and in Miami. Who knows what else is going on there, right? And this is probably in the mid uh, 1990s or something. So you were, I don't know, maybe you were you know, 10 or something uh, back then or two or, you know, but uh, while I'm, I was digging through those boxes, I noticed that there were these, um, uh, there was this group that was being uh, coded as a BM, a black male, right? And then I noticed that there was this other group that was being clo clo uh, um, coded as a BHM. And I said, well, these must be black Hispanic males or something. And I, I wasn't sure uh, what this group was. And uh, once, of course, I started looking you know, at these names, I noticed that um, there were all these Pierres were being killed. And there was this, you know, uh, this very different group or different category. And what I did, well, it's two things. One, and this is probably 15 years ago, one was I wanted to uh, bring attention or direct attention to folks that there wasn't a homogenous black American group or black group in Miami, right? That there was also this very large uh, immigrant group that I wanted people to, you know, focus attention to. And when I started, and this was including um, when I, when I started to uh, look at those data and visit Little Haiti, and I would go there on Saturday mornings to eat uh, some stew or something that reminded me of uh, Menudo and, and you know, so the Mexican, well, I'm, I'm always fixated on food and, and, and wine, if, if you didn't notice. But anyway, so that was part of how I was trying to, you know, understand this, uh, this uh, very large and distinct uh, community in the northern 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 end of Miami, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to um, attract uh, criminologists to understanding that there wasn't, you know, there weren't variations within this, you know, b black or African American category, and within, within those neighborhoods, there were also variations within Liberty City and Little Haiti, and I, I don't remember um, exactly how or how we measured it, or were you in that? Or I think Jake was in elementary school uh, when when we did that study. And what what we were trying to, uh, and maybe roughly now was was to uh, show or tell people that uh, this black group was not homogenous, that it was very heterogeneous, and that it, immigration had, um, on the one hand, in Little Haiti that um, we did see some evidence of the immigration, you know, protective effect, even though this was a group that had, you know, extremely high rates of poverty and extremely high rates of, um, of disorganization. Um, it also had very high rates of, uh, of uh, employment in the secondary sector. It just happened to be working in two or three, you know, uh, very basic or low paying jobs. Um, and that the variations in that community were, were, were different than in the African-American community. Okay, somebody else? Yeah, we have time for one more? Can I just make a comment, which is, I, 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 I could, when Samson suddenly introduced the, the, uh, the idea that um, immigrant, immigrant populations are associated with the a lower crime rate. I thought this was rather surprising because this is the sort of general standard of the, the immigration literature for the last 20 years. I mean, I mean, everybody who's ever done a study has shown that first places with high levels of first-generation immigrants have, uh, have lower crime rates. I mean, it's, 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 I don't like general, generalizations, and it's, it's obviously true of poor immigrants. It's not true of, for instance, if you think of... Um, 
immigration into Britain, the fifth largest immigrant group is Americans. Nobody ever thinks of them as immigrants, and they disappear and intermarry. And, and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of corporate criminals there. But uh, uh, the, the, the first generation thing, the problem is about it is, though, the general thing that comes out of that is that second generations, as they get become assimilated, as they become more American, for example, or more British, tend to have a higher crime rate. I, I, if when, when they start thinking in terms of uh, the American dream, and they find they're not getting it, they're going to the worst schools and all that sort of thing, that's when you get discontent and that's when you get crime. But at first, in terms of the first generation, there's hardly any evidence anywhere in the world which has ever shown that first generation immigrants have higher crime rates. Yeah, that's, that's what we refer to as the immigration effect. I mean, the Americanization effect, <laughs> right? Over time, as they become more assimilated, um, the, the levels of crime increase. And, and it's very, I mean, I think very interestingly that, that if you think of uh, immigration, that what, what it actually, and, and this bulimic effect, which I'm always talking about, is it's actually internal colonization. It's, it's bringing in labor when, the, you know, the bourgeoisie need it and throwing them out when they don't need it. And as Dave says, using the criminal justice system as the main cutting edge to do this. But it's colonization here. So I'm sorry, the way that I would interpret